Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. Special Report, Nine Insights to Boost Primary Source Instruction, which is sponsored by JSTOR, a nonprofit service of Ithaca. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers and to submit any comments. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions and comments into the Q&A module as they occur to you. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email from JSTOR with a link to the archive version and where to access the full report. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Bill Mickey, our moderator for today. All right, thank you very much, Sabrina. Hi, everybody. My name is Bill Mickey. I am the editorial director at Choice. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, I wanna quickly introduce you to the organizations behind it. And then I'll provide some background and a peek at the report. And from there, we'll introduce our panelists. Choice is a publishing unit of the Association of College and Research Libraries, which is one of the largest divisions of the American Library Association. Our history is in reviews of print and digital scholarly resources for undergraduate study. And our modern history includes a growing portfolio of content formats aimed at professional development topics, such as webinars, podcasts, case studies, and research reports, such as the one we're presenting about today. Um, advance the slides. Here we go. Um, oops, one too far. Okay, so Charles is fortunate to have worked closely with uh, JSTOR to produce the report. JSTOR is part of Ithaca and their suite of products and services include Constellect, ArtStore, Portico, and Ithaca SNR. So on to the situation. Um, and it is as we've defined it, uh, coming to an understanding about how digitized primary sources are being utilized in instruction, how libraries are providing access and instruction, and how faculty are implementing them in their classes. The digital distinction is important because, as we all know, there's been a broad shift to the use of digital materials in instruction. Typically, uh, digital literacy support has this covered um, but we've learned that there's an immediate need for further instruction that addresses the unique characteristics of using digitized or born digital primary sources. This has been evidenced in the general lack of literature that frameworks instruction and use of these specific sources. Um, so the solution um, is a JSTOR choice collaboration on this report to help fill in that gap. Uh, the report includes a literature review section, which traces the history of teaching with primary sources and quickly arrives at our contemporary dilemma, which is the digital physical primary source divide. There's a lot of literature out there that supports teaching and learning with physical uh, primary sources, but not so much on using digital primary sources. We've also conducted two surveys, one to librarians and one to teaching faculty. Uh, deployed in May 2023, questions focused on the challenges and benefits of teaching and learning with digital primary sources 
in an undergraduate environment. Survey data revealed that uh, further instruction and support are greatly needed in uh, the areas of skill development, awareness, literacy, library faculty collaboration, contextual help, and promotion. Further, we conducted five interviews to highlight best practices at institutions that are already putting some of these insights into actions, into action. So um, the insights, which you see here, um, we've arrived at these through the literature review, the surveys and the interviews, which form the bulk of the report, uh, which we're presenting today. Um, each of these components revealed nine key insights that are identified throughout the report that help guide librarians and faculty toward potential solutions. And today, with the help from our panelists, uh, who also happen to be featured in the report, we're going to explore several of those insights in more depth. And here's who will be joining us today. Um, our presenters will introduce themselves. So Virginia, why don't we start with you? Absolutely. Hey, everyone. I'm Virginia Seymour. I'm the head librarian of research and instruction at Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD, in Savannah, Georgia. And I also write for JSTOR Daily and have a column um, on that platform. Thank you. And Michaela? Hello from Los Angeles. My name is Michaela Ullmann. I work at the University of Southern California Libraries. Um, from 2006 through February of this year, I was in Special Collections where I served as the Excel Studies Librarian and where I created and led the Primary Source Literacy Instruction Program for the last seven or so years. Um, I have now moved on to being the Head of Instruction and Assessment for all of USC Libraries. Uh, but integrating primary source literacy more widely across the libraries and into the curricul curriculum is still a priority in this in this new role of mine. Excellent. Thank you, Michaela. And, and Michael, over to you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Vath. I am the Director of Product Management here at JSTOR. I've been here for over 10 years working on all different aspects of JSTOR and the JSTOR platform, and I am excited to share a little bit with you all today and also hear from uh, my fellow uh, panelists. Excellent, thanks, Michael. Um, and once again, I'm Bill Mickey. I oversee the editorial operation at Choice, which includes Choice Reviews and the rest of our content portfolio. Okay, so to make sure we all start from the same baseline, um, this is a description of primary source literacy as defined in 2018 by um, the Society of American Archivists, ACRL, and the Rare Books and Manuscripts Group. Uh, primary source literacy is the combination of knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to effectively find, interpret, evaluate, and ethically use primary sources within specific disciplinary contexts in order to create new knowledge or revise existing understandings. Now, while digitized primary sources are not explicitly defined here, the guidelines do note that, quote, a surrogate is often a digital version of a physical source that is housed in a specific collection or repository. Um, so over to the left there of, of with the two data points, our survey of librarians and faculty, um, each of those groups both concluded in significant numbers that undergraduate students need extra help with digitized primary source literacy. So that brings us to our first uh, insight, which is collaboration. Um, and that is more specifically to collaborate to boost discoverability and learning. Uh, the literature highlights the benefits of librarian and faculty partnerships in teaching with primary sources. And this certainly holds true for digital primary source uh, instruction. So how do librarians rate collaboration with their faculty college? According to our survey, not so great. Um, only 15% of respondents rate their collaboration with faculty as high or extremely high. No doubt that among those 15% who are doing their collaborative work is our first presenter, Michaela Ullman, who has made a point out of collaborating with faculty. So Michaela, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. So my um, I will be talking to one of the first tips, teach the teacher. Um, in my over 16 years of building and leading a primary source literacy instruction program, I have learned that teaching primary source literacy skills starts uh, oftentimes by having a conversation with the instructor of a class that's scheduled to come in for a session. During this meeting, I can casually assess uh, what they know about the learning outcomes we try to teach their students, and if necessary, even sneak in a little teach the teacher time. In my experience, instructors themselves are often not completely familiar or comfortable with locating and accessing our primary source collections, or they are unfamiliar with our guidelines, procedures, etc. And sometimes it's just that they have outdated information about certain things. During my time teaching primary source literacy sessions, I have learned not to take the instructor's own primary source literacy skills for granted. And I've seen a great difference in the success of an instruction session when the instructor is more comfortable with navigating our materials and procedures themselves. Next slide, please. I've established a process through which all instructors working on a class visit to special collections for the first time are asked to meet with the librarian first. And in this initial meeting with an instructor, we go over our guidelines and procedures and discuss mutual expectations and learning outcomes for the session. Having the instructor on board and more comfortable with using special collections themselves usually results in more engagement from them, which is needed to get students buy-in for these sessions. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see this is a snapshot from our website where we address, uh, which has our class request form, but also which addresses um, that instructors are asked to uh, meet with us first and so that we can go over anything, anything in question and also about the whole process of you know, our learning outcomes and how we actually teach classes in special collections. Next slide, please. In addition to establishing learning outcomes and going over procedures, these conversations are a great way to introduce instructors to collections and materials for the teaching or research area that they may not be aware of yet. If time allows, I even bring out some of the physical materials so that the instructor and I can discuss which materials lend themselves best to teaching their session. Needless to say that these conversations have increased the awareness and discoverability of our materials among, amongst instructors and through them amongst students. Next slide, please. Lastly, I also use these conversations with the instructors as a starting point to address new developments in primary source literacy, new databases, areas where we feel the need to emphasize in class, uh, areas we feel the need to emphasize in class, sorry, such as archival silences and biases represented in our collections, and to introduce ideas to change up assignments or plan future sessions. Furthermore, these conversations offer an excellent opportunity to inform instructors about the USC Libraries Research Award, through which students can gain honors and win monetary prizes for their research using primary source collections and other library resources. Many instructors have actually created or expanded assignments that ask students to use primary sources, so that they can submit these papers for the research award. A nice side effect that resulted from these conversations. And I should also add that we started um, with students actually only qualifying when they used physical primary sources, but upon review, we also included um, digital primary sources. So that has um, even increased <laughs> submission of papers even more. Thank you. Great, right. thank you, Michaela. Um, and before we Kick it over to Virginia, um, she, who has also found some success partnering with faculty. Um, we interviewed a colleague of hers, uh, Stephanie Kaplan, at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, and Stephanie agrees that what makes the partnership so successful is that uh, librarians are subject experts in finding information. And I, meeting Stephanie, uh, is a subject expert in whatever the content is, and combined we can focus holistically on these skills. So Virginia, perhaps you can uh, walk us through some of your best practices. Yeah, absolutely. So just like Michaela, I find it essential for librarians to gauge faculty familiarity and understanding prior to any session. Now, we tend to speak different languages. I think maybe that's what 
uh, that dissatisfaction that uh, Bill was talking about earlier comes from um, in part. And depending on faculty's background, they may not be familiar with the skills or methods we teach in the library classrooms. Um, when my staff discusses instructional goals, they often notice above all that terminology isn't shared. Uh, with primary sources, this can involve basic language barriers that cause confusion, like referring to all special collections as archives or an entire library website as a database. Um, so when we introduce digital tools and collections, this can become an even bigger barrier. And with that in mind, I think there are a few key areas um, of friction between librarians and faculty that I found that when we address um, in my institution, they've positively impacted student experiences. So one of those, um, and maybe the most prominent, might uh, be library and research terminology. Uh, for librarians, I think it's essential to get honest about terminology and what is actually the most important to hold on to and what could be reconsidered, what is causing unnecessary confusion. Um, and to be explicit with, um, what you're teaching with faculty. They're reinforcements with students outside of the library. So it helps to make an effort to get them comfortable and confident in key terms because they're going to be reinforcing that when they leave the library with their students. For faculty, I think it's essential to be open to learning new terms um, and asking for confirmation when the librarian is using different terms and than they are. Um, there's there's probably a good reason. Um, beyond library and research specific terminology, um, another thing that I encounter a lot working with primary sources is material specific terminology. Uh, librarians, I think, should be leaning on faculty for their discipline specific knowledge. Um, Librarians are curious, and this is a great time to get curious, to stop and ask faculty how they would describe a particular item or material. How does it fit into their discipline um, in their own language? And I think in general, making intentional moves to build reciprocal learning relationships is key to this. Both faculty and librarians can take the time to reframe their relationship as a partnership with shared knowledge. Um, I work in an art and design setting, so I often think of reframing my relationship with faculty as becoming a project team uh, with them rather than having a client service relationship. Next slide. Thanks. Um, I think too, it's critical to dig deeper into who the students are as researchers um, and what their needs are, are in a particular course. Um, in the report, uh, Bill mentioned my colleague, Stephanie Kaplan. Um, it, she discusses timing literacy interventions, and I agree with this emphasis. I think it pays dividends to insert library instruction into a course at the most relevant time, um, the most impactful time, rather than getting it out of the way in the first week or adding it, um, especially when it comes to special collections material, um, as an end of term field trip. And I run into a lot of librarians who feel like they know the right timing for literacy sessions, but have no control over um, when they participate in a course. Um, and I want to push against that a little bit. Um, I think it's worth taking the time to explore a course's syllabi and assignments to understand how skills and concepts fit within that syllabus itself um, and how the research process is undertaken in that particular context. Because when a faculty member can see that you're invested in their vision, that you understand their course, um, they can better understand your recommendations about content and timing. Um, at my institution, we receive course details and materials with each uh, session request. I think that's super helpful if you can do that um, in your forms or whatever process you work with. But um, I can see that volume makes it difficult uh, to have these discussions one on one every time. Um, so as the head of a department, I spend a lot of time each quarter with faculty in preemptive meetings, um, speaking to them one on one, having conversations to help them understand what timely literacy instruction looks like, so they're making better choices um, for themselves. Next slide. Um, beyond timing, I, I also try to make it a point to ask really pointed clarification 
clarifying questions about the course and assignments, even if I've worked with a faculty member before. Um, and I check in prior to the session to get more information about the students themselves. Um, I really believe that ultimately you need to kind of be invested in all three of these things. So the professor's goals for your course and its assignments, uh, connecting material and skills to that specific context, and also meeting students at their interest and experience level. Um, the same course term to term is not going to have the same students and the same needs. Um, so I think it's really critical to that relationship to not forget that. Um, and I try, um, and I think a lot of my team does too, to make these connections uh, to the professor's vision explicit to students, returning to, you know, why does this matter in this context? Why would you use this skill? Um, why take one approach and not the other? Making sure that that's clear to students um, as much as you feel like it's clear um, to your lesson. Next slide. Um, I think Investing in the vision also means connecting to the disciplines, values, and methodology, as well as the course content, um, because even basic searching does not look the same in every context, um, and even small efforts help. My team uses familiar works from a course specifically in their examples and exercises to support skill building um, in a context that students are familiar with, um, helping them understand otherwise kind of difficult concepts um, with familiar um, environments and terms. Um, last slide. So um, I think lastly in, in the report, I discuss consistency and continuity in a few um, scenarios um, like program documentation and lesson content. But more than anything, I find consistency with faculty builds confidence and trust. Um, a faculty member might have a different library instructor every quarter um, in my institution, but uh, we make efforts to maintain that trust with consistent policies and procedures and a clear expectation about the roles of a faculty member and a librarian in a session. Um, two issues I encounter frequently is disappointment um, when materials and special collections need to be um, held back from use when they're being used too often, um, or when a faculty member can't book an instruction session last minute. But by building and maintaining consistency with those faculty, they know what to expect in a library classroom and how to support it. They react more positively towards restrictions that must be enforced because they know we're on the same team. Excellent, thank you, Virginia. Um, and now we'll, we'll head on to our next insight from the report, uh, which is the importance of building instructional scaffolding. Um, this quote comes from a Journal of Academic Librarianship article written by Patricia Garcia, uh, Joseph Luke and uh, Elizabeth Yackel, and it emphasizes the importance of a scaffolded approach to teaching with primary sources. Um, I should add that this article is cited at the end of this presentation um, and also in a report as well. Um, but to talk more about scaffolding, uh, here once again is Michaela. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, I know that many of us who teach with um, primary source materials struggle with the lack of time to introduce students to the various learning outcomes around primary source literacy instruction and oftentimes the focus of a class visit is um is on the actual is on the material um, the primary sourced um materials in in our collections and not so much on on the databases um which has always been a concern of mine which was always something that i wanted to integrate you know i always have been trying to integrate the the database instruction more into the teaching, but since time can be so limited and many of us only get a one shot, it can be hard to do it all in like an hour or 90 minutes or so. Um, during the pandemic, however, and while teaching on Zoom, I was finally able to focus more on integrating primary source databases into my teaching. Um, I did so by using databases for in-class assignments, but I also created an asynchronous teaching platform in Scalar, which features a chapter on navigating electronic primary sources. Um, 
Interestingly enough, the moment we returned to in-person teaching at USC, the instructors really wanted to focus on the physical materials um, during the in-class visits again, um, again, leaving very little time to address the digital databases in class and really working through them thoroughly. But the modules and related tutorials on digital primary sources that we designed for the teaching toolkit are still being offered and available and they're used frequently for asynchronous learning uh, and in a flipped approach. So, you know, um, instructors will assign some of these tutorials, some of these modules from the teaching toolkit ahead of time before the students actually come into class or they work, have them work through them afterwards. Um, and while I would personally love to be able to spend more time on focusing on some of the databases during class time, I personally do not think that teaching students to interrogate physical materials is taking away from them learning how to navigate digital primary sources, quite the contrary. Uh, next slide, please. I believe that it's safe to assume that many students will make use of digital primary sources in their academic career because it's so much easier and faster to access them than you know going to an archive and work with physical materials. So I see um, the time they get to spend with physical materials in the classroom as a preparation for this work in the digital environment. They'll benefit from becoming more aware of the various formats and how materiality, size, shape, texture, etc., play a role in analyzing an item. And they also learn to critically analyze primary sources, no matter if they're physical or digital. While teaching in the classroom, I usually mention related databases for a certain class subject alongside the physical materials in our collections. And if we have the, have the luxury of hosting an embedded class or a class that comes in um, several times throughout the semester, then I will certainly try to integrate an exercise with, with a primary source database. And as I mentioned earlier, primary source databases um, are also referenced in our teaching toolkit as well as in our um, research guide for primary sources. Next slide, please. Curriculum mapping is uh, another great tool to build students' primary source literacy skills over time, starting with basic research skills and basic concepts in lower level classes and building up a more expert level knowledge around, um, throughout the curriculum. And as Virginia mentioned earlier, I think librarians oftentimes know best when this information literacy instruction should come in. So I absolutely agree with her that it's so crucial to have the syllabus. Um, we also requested with our class request form and if we do not receive a syllabus, we actually um, will most likely say no to a class because we feel we need to know what's going on and what students are actually doing before and after they come in uh, to special collections and also because we want to you know, see if maybe a better timing would be in place for information that we see instruction. Um, and then with curriculum mapping, it's even better so because we can make sure that all the information building, the skill building is, is placed at the accurate time. Um, it is also particularly helpful if instructors can be convinced to make the visits to special collections as well as other elements, for example, working through the asynchronous modules from the teaching toolkit part of their syllabus. So I, I also highly believe in syllabus integration of these um, of these information literacy skill building. Um, the syllabus integration helps to ensure that primary source literacy instruction is an ongoing element um, of their teaching and that the learning outcomes um, be distributed using curriculum mapping are being met. All right, thank you, Michaela. Um, so JSTOR's Michael Vath was also featured in the report. Uh, Michael, you shared that, quote, one of the fundamentals we found at JSTOR and Ithaca more broadly is the increased prevalence and importance of helping students develop primary source literacy. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yes, sure. Happy to do so, Bill. Um, I think, not surprisingly, uh, I think for us, it really started with Ithaca developing our own understanding and deeper appreciation of the importance of primary source literacy, of teaching with primary sources. Um, and the Guidelines from 2018 have been have been mentioned a couple of times here already. Uh, those have been very important and informative to us. And so starting with just our own understanding and appreciation for that importance, and then really 
uh, starting to ask ourselves what we can do about it. So, uh, so here highlighted on the screen is a report that came out of Ithaca SNR two years ago that also uh, delved into the same topic. And if you go to the next slide, specifically for JSTOR, we started to ask ourselves, okay, as we are working to incorporate more and more primary source materials into the JSTOR experience and deeply integrated alongside all of the great secondary literature that we have, that gives us a lot of opportunity to do impactful things here. So what, what are some of those things? And I will highlight a couple of them here today, the first of which is that we wanted to develop a set of tools and workflows that just make it easier for the type of collaboration and curation that both Virginia and Michaela are talking about here to be able to happen. So make it easier for, for librarians and archivists, instructors to curate a set of materials on JSTOR across primary and secondary sources and to then be able to to share those with students because that's a that's one of many uh, important tactics to help students develop um, that deeper understanding of those materials and also those literacy skills. So the more we can do to help make that easier and and even to facilitate that collaboration uh, that is that is so important. And so what you're seeing here on the screen is this space on JSTOR that we call the workspace. So this ends up being the hub for a lot of those, those features and workflows. And the second area uh, that we are deeply, deeply invested in is really along the lines of the topic of discovery and discoverability and creating connections between primary and secondary sources. Uh, and so I will elaborate on that a bit further uh, in a few slides, but I think, uh, Bill, it's back to you as we as we dive into this discovery topic uh, more broadly. Right, right. Thank you, Michael. Um, so yeah, discoverability definitely is key, and this flows perfectly into our third and final insight for, for this webinar, um, and that is to create new paths for discoverability and digital literacy. Um, so what are we up against here? Uh, one culprit is the abundance of different platforms and sources. In our survey, both librarians and faculty rank discoverability and resource awareness as particularly challenged. Um, one librarian survey respondent noted, uh, I find student awareness both of resources themselves and how beneficial they can be for their studies is lacking. Another ranked the lack of awareness factor as a 10, adding that students are rarely, if ever, prepared to recognize what, recognize what a primary source is and isn't, as well as difficulties in recognizing the context in which that primary source sits. Um, Virginia, you provided a, a tip in the report to teach transferable skills. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, I think it's always a balancing act to provide uh, literacy experiences that are tailored enough to feel relevant uh, while helping students understand what transferable skills they're actually gaining. Uh, to me, this is um, kind of most easily illustrated in in-person special collections experiences. Students come to see material related to a particular assignment maybe, uh, but they don't on their own intuit how they might apply the skills they're using like close looking or bias investigation outside of that particular experience. Next slide please. Um, I think that this is true to when working with digital resources and tools if not more so. Um, my aim in general is that my team prioritizes connecting concepts to meaning and skills to practice across different resources and contexts. And this doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, one of the things that I like to do in class, and I think Stephanie mentions in the report, um, is to teach um, advanced image search strategies in JSTOR um, and then assign other primary source resources to students who then explore them on their own and teach their peers how to use the resource so that students themselves are making connections between what they learned in JSTOR to the similarities and differences in other uh, platforms that they might then go on to use in that course um, and future courses. 
Um, I, I think too that this isn't just relevant to databases um, like JSTOR, but that the material both within digital collections and in physical collections. Um, working with primary sources and art objects um, is also, I think, important to consider how we address transferability of skills across formats and materials, which can become quite complex in um, digital collection spaces where everything is a flat image or a video. Um, so to me, this means getting students to transfer understanding across these complex topics um, rooted in um, things that they understand already about the material that they might have experienced um, in person in special collections. I'm thinking about topics like how bias factors into primary sources versus secondary sources that they might have encountered or um, you know, with different types of material, like how creators' perspectives are manifested in a letter versus a fashion sketch. Um, next slide. Um, right, <laughs> so more practically, I think, especially for students, it also really helps to uh, consciously and um, explicitly emphasize how concepts transfer across assignments and disciplines. Um, in my institution, this often means asking how we can apply parts of the research process that are used in a 100 level art history course or, or writing class um, to something more disciplinary like an interior design brief or a, a business case study. Um, how can we apply visual literacy skills to textual analysis or um, examinations of trustworthy sources? Understanding that the skills that they're building in maybe the one time they're seeing a librarian or in special collections um, to their um, investigation that they're doing on their own. I think Michaela's talking um, to this um, really appropriately in terms of um, the research that students are doing on their own outside of their courses. Um, you know, I think ultimately this um, is often the relevance that students need to make concepts stick um, and to make primary sources, whether they are digital or in person, um, engaging and something to pursue outside of the classroom. Great, thank you, Virginia. Um, so this quote from Heidi Craig and Kevin O'Sullivan in their libraries in the academic Libraries in the Academy article, uh, Primary Source Literacy in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond, sums up the differences in using physical and digital primary sources, as well as the importance of teaching the research skills unique to both. Um, and Michael, I was going to come back to you to share a little bit more of your perspective on this. Yes, thank you, Bill. So um, I mentioned a little bit ago that this is another area of big focus for us. And, you know, if supporting the curation and sharing of primary and secondary source materials is primarily aimed at instructors, librarians, archivists, uh, I would say in this area, our focus is more directly on how we can help students create identify connections between primary and secondary sources as another um, very important part of developing evaluation and understanding uh, and literacy skills uh, for primary sources. So we think a lot about this opportunity that we have as we bring, again, more and more primary sources into JSTOR along our, alongside our secondary literature how can we help surface really important, relevant, timely connections between those materials that can help for that context building and that understanding? So the example that I'll focus on here is one that arose when we first began bringing images, bringing visual materials into JSTOR. And we knew, of course, that one of the things that would be very important would be to support students and instructors and librarians in being able to just work with images when there's plenty of times when a user knows I'm, I'm here to work with images, I just need to be able to do that. And the best thing that we can do is get out of their way and let them work with images. So of course we developed very image centric discovery 
uh, search and browse and interactive features and capabilities to support that. But we also wanted to develop a kind of broader suite of search experiences and discovery experiences that could uh, surface some of those connections. And so what we also introduced at, the, at that time and have continued to evolve is when a student runs a search across all of the materials on JSTOR that they have access to, our system will, based on the search that the student has run and based on the relevance of the potential text results that could come back and the potential visual results that could come back, a determination is made as to whether or not to show the student just a, a, a set of text results, which still is most of most of our content, or if the connections are high enough and the relevance is strong enough to present something more like you see here, where you are getting a blend of visual search results and text search results. And that can, and of course, a student at that point can drill in any direction that, that, that is desirable to them. But being able to surface that when we know there's a lot of connections and high relevancy gives us the opportunity for a student to find a primary source, in this case, a visual resource. Maybe it's an art painting. And then at the same time, they're able to see peer-reviewed secondary literature about that painting or about that uh, artist or that medium or that period or anything like that. And so that can be a really powerful and sometimes serendipitous moment uh, where those connections can be can emerge and can be made by the students and that can help them in, in better understanding these materials. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is highlighting just, and I won't, I won't elaborate on it in quite as much detail, but another uh, similar approach that we are taking is where we can, through our own deep understanding of the secondary literature that we have on the platform and the metadata about, about that content, where we can create even more explicit connections between materials, um, not just driven by search relevance, then we have the opportunity at the item level for, for a student to be looking at one piece of content on JSTOR, whether it is secondary literature or whether it is a primary source object of any, of any format. And we can, again, emerge connections to other materials, to supporting materials, uh, related materials, both in, the, in other primary source collections and in the secondary literature to help with a bit more of that context. And, and we think there's a lot of great opportunity that we have started to, um, to bring forward and, and will continue. And in particular, we, we, we have an opportunity to do that in the sort of contained um, content corpus that we have on JSTOR, which is lots and lots of peer-reviewed academic secondary literature and lots and lots of uh, scholarly primary sources in ways that's actually harder to do when students are, as they often want to do, you know, just running a general web search on Google. And so the more we can use that, that deeper, under, more deeply understood content corpus that is highly academic, the more we can create those connections and surface that and help with, with skill building and understanding of these materials. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, so yeah, Virginia, Michaela, and Michael, thank you so much for your amazing insights and guidance. And I think this quote uh, from one of the respondents to our librarian survey summarizes our research pretty well. And that is overall, while challenges still exist, the current state of digitized primary and secondary source availability and discovery is promising. The digitization efforts and advancements in online platforms have greatly expanded access to these valuable resources empowering researchers and students to explore a wide range of materials conveniently from anywhere in the world. Um, so an optimistic viewpoint there for sure. Um, but before we get into the Q&A, um, I'll just quickly showcase what's next. Um, as mentioned on the registration form when you first signed up for this webinar, you'll all receive uh, free access to the full report. Uh, JSTOR will be sharing that um, in a post-webinar email this Thursday, November 16th, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and at that time, be sure to download the full report and then implement the insights, tips, and best practices as best you can. All right, so let's get on to the questions. If you haven't yet, feel free to enter your question into the Q&A box 
and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. All right. We'll just get organized here. Okay. Um, one question comes from Connie, and she would like, or they would like tips on how to help students who have started their papers and now need to find primary sources to fit their argument. Who would like to handle that one first? Virginia? I'll volunteer um, to you. <laughs> yeah, although I don't think you'll like my answer. Um, I think it's still true. You know, Michaela's talking about teaching the teacher, and this is something we run into a lot that faculty don't necessarily um, know how to teach their students to go to primary sources as a first step and frame their hypothesis and arguments around a primary source. And then you have students who are coming up with this idea with no grounding or basis and saying, I want primary sources that agree with me. It's almost impossible, right? <laughs> if you're asking the question, you know that it's difficult to do. Um, and I think that's where working with faculty early, especially at a department level, um, comes into play. We, we have to help faculty understand what the limitations are, that students are not coming in with the expert disciplinary knowledge uh, that the faculty have where they can make informed hypotheses and then kind of budget and go back to the historical record. Um, so working with faculty to kind of understand that process and how to support their students with your materials through that process, I think is essential. There's not an easy, oh yeah, this is how we search to find the answer to what you're looking for, unfortunately. Right. Michaela, anything you want to add? I think Virginia really uh, summarized this really well. I also like one thing that I also, you know, try to point out to students that come with this particular question is, you know, also looking at silences. What if you cannot find an, a, a primary source? What also what what can that tell you? But yeah, but I also agree. Well, you know, I mean, this primary source literacy, uh, primary source research is messy and um, you don't you don't want to go about this finding the sources that fit your argument. <laughs> you you need to <laughs> look at the research um, process uh, differently. Right. So Michaela, we'll stick with you for this next question, which is from Chelsea. Um, how many of these pre-meetings do you have with faculty per term? And how do you handle resistance from faculty to expend this much planning time in advance of the session, if any? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's not that, I mean, it, it, come, it depends on how many class requests you get, but also how many new instructors you're going to work with. If I've worked with an instructor before, I don't necessarily have to have that meeting unless there is something completely new that they're doing, a new syllabus or revised syllabus. It's more for instructors that really haven't been to special collections and haven't worked with us to just go over the procedures and go over what the collaboration is. Also, I did change um, the terminology since we were talking about terminology before. I'm not using um, instructional services anymore in, in any of my work, uh, also now in my new job, I call it col uh, instructional collaborations to make sure that this is a collaborative effort. We're not just providing a service. We are experts in our own field and we bring expertise to it. So it is a collaboration and that also kind of communicates, you know, what's expected of, of each um, person. Now I forgot the second part. Oh, the resistance. <laughs> yes. Um, we have it and we, we try to make it fairly clear in our language that if instructors are not willing to take the time to meet with us for an hour, I mean, that's basically a, rec a prerequisite for an instruction session. And if that's not being met, then um, we can potentially say no, and we might. I mean, th there's probably a few other, you know, maybe like the instructor also doesn't provide a syllabus, but these are like red flags. If, if somebody isn't willing to take the time to meet with you to go over, their instruction session to provi provide a syllabus, um, then it's it's probably not going to be a very um, successful collaboration, and also the students won't benefit as much as they should. So um, that could be a reason actually to say no to that instruction session. I don't know if Virginia wants to chime in on that. 
No, I, I totally agree. And I will, if you need to hear it, I will say it. You can say no to faculty if it's not going to serve the students in the most effective way. Um, and if you can explain to them why and, you know, what might change that and the collaboration, you know, all the better. But it, it's okay to say no to a not fruitful relationship with a faculty member. Great. Right. Okay. So, uh, Virginia, I think we'll stick with you for this next one. Uh, this question's from Megan. How do you scaffold classes when you only see them once and can never be sure a class coming in has had the first level? Sure. I, I mean, I think um, my team is investigating that a lot right now um, and how to get all students come at a base level, whether or not they've come before. And some of what we're doing is asynchronous modules and things like that. Others are getting into classes that are um, required for all students and, and not necessarily being a part of that class, but having materials available to the faculty that teach those classes about kind of basic research skills. Um, the fact is, you know, it's, for, for us, it's keeping that conversation going with faculty throughout the quarter, even if you're not coming back, checking in with them a couple weeks later to say, you know, what stuck, what didn't, is there anything um, outside of the library that we can provide to your students? Um, do they need extra help sessions? Would they like a you know, drop-in hour, something like that? Um, keeping that conversation with the faculty member that has eyes on their students as they progress through the weeks. Um, you know, right now is, is what we do. We have um, a high volume. Um, so yeah, I would love for my team to come in three or four times in a quarter, but um, we, we do rely a lot on faculty eyes and right. asynchronous resources. And then Michaela, I probably should have started with you on this question since you had the scaffolding chapter or section, but what, any, any follow-up you want to add? I think our experience is very similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I we we also use now that we have all these modules. We had some some stuff before the pandemic, but it was more like written uh written information on our website. But now that we have these modules and these tutorials, we do a lot of like a flipped approach, where we ask instructors to send out basic tutorials with like you know what is a primary source or how what is special collections yada 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 to just bring the all students to like a certain level or to yeah to a mutual understanding. Um, the other thing is, like I mentioned, the curriculum mapping that that really comes in handy. You, I mean, you certainly don't have the time and the energy to do this for every discipline that you work with. But at USC, music and history are like the biggest hitters in special collections. So for us, we took the time to do like curriculum mapping to see like which classes come into special collections and, you know, and then like looking like which does it really make sense for these classes to be the ones to to come in and teach these skills or do we need to catch an earlier class that's mandatory for all those students in this discipline to teach them the basic skills and then how can we scaffold um throughout throughout the whole curriculum so um again it's a little bit of an effort but it does pay out if you you know work with a, a one discipline like very intensively right thank you okay good um michael question for you is there any future plan to add a primary source button to JSTOR in the item type area of the advanced search? Oh, great question. I think uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to just in my head think about what we've done with images specifically where we where we have and we already have an image specific uh, advanced search, but in the in the global um, JSTOR advanced search um we that is still in our roadmap to revisit it it is actually um in in it, overdue for for an overhaul uh, especially as these materials have been coming in michael i'll stick with you on this one um there's a where you know, the questions are coming in fast and furious um we got bumped uh basically if you could provide a, an example of what a digital primary source is um the person asking the question i think deals primarily in physical yes i i work primarily with print resources and this webinar opened up a new window to me 
So perhaps, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I think we could probably have a whole nother web. I think there was even another question about um, uh, the difference of social materials and, and primary source materials. So th this feels like it could be a whole nother, uh, a whole nother report. Um, I mean, for the purposes of what we're trying to enable on JSTOR, it is um, almost exclusively, if not exclusively, collections of curated, digitized primary source materials that are curated by museums and uh, archives at institutions and special collections. So it is um, it is really mostly defined by the curators and archivists of those collections. Uh, so um, uh, it would be better to go go to the go to the source for the for the clearest definitions of of what of what is what is considered primary source in that in that academic context. Um, there was another question though that I will grab uh, just to give um, Virginia and Michaela uh, a, a bit of a break because mo most <laughs> of the questions appear to be for them, which I I fully support because. At JSTOR, our you know our focus is helping the Virginias and the Michaelas and the and the faculty and the students of the world. Um, so it's it's good to see there are a lot of questions for for them as the experts. But I'll, I'll take this one quickly. Uh, has JSTOR noticed a substantial difference in how the display of images uh, is uh, the display of images is impacting search? Do searches uh, for certain terms like Gordon Parks look different pre and post inclusion of images? I would say it's a great question. I would say uh, yes for certain searches, and this kind of gets at what I was describing. Some searches I would say are largely unaffected uh, by the inclusion of images because the reality is a lot for a lot of keyword searches, the the most highly relevant set of results for that user uh, is 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 likely to be, or in those cases, is a, a set of text results. Um, and then there are other cases where we have these great visual materials that that are really relevant to those search queries. And so that, that's where we see those blended searches arising. And in those cases, the, the follow on uh, pathway for those users uh, often is, is different because they're finding they're finding materials that they may not necessarily have been looking for, but are now suddenly seeing these connections and and finding and finding those new relevant objects, which is very, very exciting for us to see. Great. So we have a comment from a uh, from one of our attendees um, who hopes this turns into a question. Um, and they say, I'm hearing from faculty who have new or renewed interest in primary as primary sources as a means to create unique, authentic AI proof assignments, and who are looking for additional sources of these. At the same time, as a library with with responsibility for good stewardship of digitized content. I am increasingly feeling a need to think critically and proceed cautiously in how we expose digitized collections and ensure that necessary context remains with them. Are panelists able to reflect on this tension? Michaela, I'm seeing uh, you nodding your head emphatically there. Yeah, emphatically. I don't. I don't know that I have the answer though. It's. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm working a lot on and on my university level with you know everything related to generative AI at the moment and it's such a, a can of worms and there nobody knows really what we're dealing with and there are so many aspects and so many um, questions about this so um, yeah not sure about creating a unique authentic AI proof assignment really at this point but what I feel like the way I currently in a, in a way of like coming up to communicate how students should deal with AI, I, I, I actually go back a lot to the, the skill sets that you need for primary source literacy, you know, be critical, um, critically evaluate where it's coming from, who's the author, what were intentions, etc. things like that. So I, I think oftentimes it can help us know being primary source literate or making our our students primary source literate and also dealing with, with some of the aspects of um, generative AI but I'm not sure like I mean I, I know that I cannot answer this question but I'm not sure if this is helpful <laughs> Virginia is there anything you want yeah um I, I think it, it depends on what you mean by AI proof I've I've reread this question a lot <laughs> um and the exposure of digital collections. I, th I think depending on your meaning, um, you know, primary source experiences, especially in universities can be a 
great place for faculty to develop a, a broad variety of you know AI proof assignments um, to which I take I take that to mean an assignment that a student can't use AI to generate their response. Um, in our institution, it's because a lot of our archival material is about people that have no online presence, that there's no history books written about them, things like that. So having students look at primary sources um, and reflect on them, I imagine can be really helpful um, to avoid AI kind of situations when there, there's no content out there about the subject necessarily. Um, the other thing um, too is I think it depends on your kind of goal assignment. Um, in my institution, a lot of our assignments are, are creative and, you know, incur a visual response um, and getting students to respond to primary source material or special collections material in a visual way is a great way to um, have them reflect without dealing with text generative AI at all. Excellent. So before we wrap up, um, we had a question from one of our um, attendees to um, if you would each be comfortable providing your, your contact information um, for questions following the, uh, the presentation. Okay. Um, do you want to just verbally <laughs> give out your emails? <laughs> Or we, I guess you can put it in the uh the Yeah, we can put it like. in, the, yeah. in the question and answer. Yeah. Okay, so while they're doing that, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, your excellent questions. And thanks to the panelists for their time today. And I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina for some final instructions. Great. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, you all can uh, put your contact info either in the Q&A, uh, answering a question, or in the chat. Uh, either works. Uh, but thanks so much uh, to Michaela, Virginia, and Michael for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to Bill for moderating. And thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from JSTOR with a link to the recording, as well as where to access the full report. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session and hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thanks, everybody.